All right, so this is um, part two. We're going to start with letter C, the phylum mollusca. So the phylum mollusca, um, mollusca means soft bodies. So let's take a look at what these um, animals um, are. <clears throat> All the animals in the phylum mollusca do have a soft body. So um, the sort of general characteristics of their bodies will all contain a visceral mass, and this is that soft, mushy part um, of these animals. So if you look at what is in the visceral mass, it's this whole bracketed part, everything in this orange, which contains their guts, okay? So now we have a little heart, we have a gill, we have their digestive tract, we have, um, yeah, their guts, reproductive organs here, uh, and they have a mouth, right, and a separate anus, so they have a true digestive tract. Um, so that's one thing they all have in common, this visceral mass. Um, if you look at number one in your outline, mollusca means soft bodies, uh, animals, which usually is protected by hard shell. So look, let's look at that shell. The mantle is going to be the structure, this purple line that can secrete a shell. So if this uh, mollusk makes a shell, it's the mantle that does that. So here's the shell, right, on top of that purple line, the mantle. All right, so mm, we have a foot. Mollusks can move around, so they have a muscular foot, everything in gray here. What that really means is just whatever they use to move around. So if you're thinking of a snail, a snail is a really good um, animal to think of the phylum mollusca. A snail has a really soft body where all the guts are. It has a foot that crawls around and it also has a shell. So it has a mantle that oozes out and produces the shell. Many of these um, animals in the phylum mollusca can <clears throat> have a radula. And a radula is going to be a very rough tongue with um, these... It's, a, it's called a rasping tongue. It's covered with teeth, but it's not true bony teeth or the kind of teeth that we think about our teeth are. And I wanna take that back. You know, our teeth are not actually bones, but uh, hard. <laughs> uh, they contain uh, teeth-like chitinous uh, projections on their tongues. So if you look at this beak, you know what this beak is from? This is a squid. Really interesting, right? So squid have a mouth that looks like this. It has a beak and they have a radula, which is this very rough tongue. So if you think about uh, in your notes, you have a picture of this. A snail can go around and eat, um, you know, like algae off of rocks, or they can just kind of really roughly lick um, a surface and get the uh, sort of nutrition they need with that radula. Okay, so let's take a look at the different kinds of mollusks. They have, there's many, many different kinds of mollusks. Um, it's a very big and diverse group. Um, I've listed some in underneath your body plan picture and underneath the radula picture. I have three, four, and five, which is uh, gastropods, bivalves, and cephalopods. Those are the three big categories of these mollusks. Gastropods. Um, snails and sea slugs, so here is a gastropod, um, they're going to have, um, you know, basically that foot that can move around and then um, they eat with that, that radula. Then we have bivalves. Bivalves are going to be um, a shelled creature with two halves, a top and bottom. So bi means two, right? And valve is like these shells divide into two halves. Clams, oysters, mussels, and scallops are all considered bivalves. They're all delicious. And cephalopods, uh, which means head foot, right? Cephalo actually refers to head. Pod means foot. These guys um, have really big brains, and they're very sophisticated sense organs. Um, octopus and squid, so there's a squid. This is a nautilus, by the way, um, belong to this category. Um, put a, uh, a video in here. Just give me a second. And either that 97% is empty or just full of surprises. But I want to jump up to shallow water now and look at some creatures that are positively amazing. Cephalopods, headfoot. As a kid, I knew them as calamari mostly. <laughs> but this is an octopus. This is the work of Dr. Roger Hanlon at the Marine Biological Lab. 
And just fascinating how, how cephalopods can, with their eyes, incredible eyes, sense their surrounding, look at light, look at patterns, here's an octopus moving across the reef, finds a spot to settle down, curls up, and then disappears into the background. Tough thing to do. In the next bit, we're going to see a couple of squid. These are squid. Now, males, when they fight, if they're really aggressive, they turn white. And these two males are fighting. They do it by bouncing their butts together, which is an interesting concept. Now, here's a male on the left and a female on the right. And now, the male has managed to split his color coloration so that the female only always sees the kinder, gentler squid in him. And the males on the opposite. <laughs> we're going to see it again. Let's take a look at it again. Watch the coloration. White on the right. Brown on the left, he takes a step back, so he's keeping off the other males by splitting his body, and he comes up on the other side, bingo. And I'm told that's not just a squid phenomenon with males, but I don't, I don't know if that's it. Cuttlefish, I love cuttlefish. This is a giant Australian cuttlefish, and there he is, his droopy little eyes up here. But they can do pretty amazing things, too. Here we're going to see one backing into... Uh, crevice and, and watch, his, watch his tentacles. He just pulls them in, makes them look just like algae. Disappears right into the background. Positively amazing. Here's two males fighting. Once again, they're, they're smart enough, these cephalopods, they know not to hurt each other, but look at the patterns that they can do with their skin. Okay? Just an amazing thing. There's an octopus. Sometimes they don't want to be seen when they move because predators can see them. And here's this, this guy actually can make himself look like a rock. And looking at this environment, can actually slide across the bottom using the waves and the shadows so he can't be seen. He just blends right into the, his motion blends right into the background. The moving rock trick. So we're learning lots new from the shallow water. Still exploring that deep, learning lots from the shallow water. There's a good reason why. I mean, the shallow water is full of predators. Here's a barracuda. And if you're an octopus or a cephalopod, you need to really understand how to use your surroundings to hide. In the next scene, you're going to see a nice coral bottom. And you see that an octopus would stand out very easily there if you couldn't use your camouflage, use your skin to change color and texture. Here's some algae in the foreground. And an octopus. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Now, Roger spooked him, so he took off. A cloud of ink lands. And when he lands, the octopus says, okay, I've been seen. Best thing to do is get as big as I can get. That big brown makes his eye spot very big. So he's backwards. I thought he was joking when he first showed it to me. I thought it was all graphics. So here, here it is in reverse. Watch the skin color. Watch the skin texture. Just an amazing animal. Can change color and texture to match the surroundings. Watch him blend right into this algae. One, two, three. <laughs> now he's gone and so am I. So that little clip was one of the um, my favorite. Um, clips to show you guys because the octopus is so amazing and how it can camouflage itself and really they're very very smart animals they can get themselves out of um, uh, their cages when they're you know kept in aquariums and things like that if you want to google some of those escape um, videos I'm sure you can find some on YouTube all right so those are our mollusks and our next category of animals are all worms the next three are all worms so the first one is called the phylum platyhelminthes. Um, they're known as flatworms. So let's take a look at a couple flatworms. Uh, this one is called a planaria. Uh, and planaria are flat. So you can see their body, how it's illustrated, very flat. And why um, did some worms evolve flat bodies? And it's because they have more surface area for um, absorbing both gases and absorbing um, nutrients from their environment. So um, the planaria, for example, they're going to have a flat body to absorb um, gases. And they actually do have a little tube um, that is going to help them eat. So they kind of latch on to um, a piece of chicken. <laughs> I'm saying chicken because I've, I feed them chicken sometimes when we have them. Um, or, you know, whatever um, dead uh, sort of chunk of food or organic matter that might be in a pond where they live or some fresh water they're gonna sort of attach to it and just suck in the, um, the food here. Um, but the gases can diffuse through their bodies. Planaria are really cute, actually. They look kind of like cross-eyed. Uh, these are the two <laughs> eye spots that they have. Uh, this is the head region, the ventral region of their body. 
and uh, they do crawl around. They're able to regenerate. I'll put this on uh, the module for you guys to look at the regeneration, but you can sort of cut them up into different pieces and they'll, they'll regrow. So it's really interesting uh, for planaria. <clears throat> um, in lab, if we had lab, we would be looking at planaria, but let's take a look at our second um, example of a flatworm, and this is a tapeworm. So there's our planaria. Uh, planarian is singular. Um, and let's look at the tapeworm. So a tapeworm is also flat because what its job is is to come into an animal and live inside of its digestive tract, usually the intestines, and it kind of just sits there and when the animal eats, right, the animal breaks down the food into kind of a, a liquid form and then that liquid mush with, uh, you know, will dissolve, uh, sorry, diffuse into their bodies and they can get their nutrients through diffusion. Um, the head portion of a tapeworm is really crazy looking. You can see it here. It has both hooks as well as suckers and that's to latch on to your digestive tract, the wall, because you know that your digestive tract is constantly um, squeezing your wastes out your body. So in order for the tapeworm to stay in there and not get squeezed out, it attaches to the wall of your intestines. Um, this is another example up here. This is called a fluke. Um, blood flukes are another kind of parasitic uh, worm, flatworm, that lives inside of people, can infect people. And uh, this is interesting because the male is the larger tape, uh, sorry, fluke. The female is much smaller. And there's actually a groove that the male has in his body that the female sits in. And they basically mate um, all the time and produce eggs all the time. So they're constantly producing um, offspring. But those are your sort of three examples of the phylum platyhelminth. Okay, so let's look at, um, we talked about the flat body, number one. Number two, the gastrovascular cavity of flatworms is highly branched and provides an extensive surface area for absorption of nutrients. So this is um, illustrated by basically this sort of brown kind of zigzaggy pattern that goes in, right? So that's a branching pattern. Um, Oh, actually, I think I'm reading this wrong. It's the, the pink, sorry. The pink is the gastrovascular cavity. And you see how the pink is branched out, same, same concept. But the branching, heavy branching, lets, um, lets more nutrients uh, diffuse. You can see the highly branched network here of the brown. So you have uh, that as a increase of surface area. And then I have number three, some examples, uh, tapeworms, flukes, and then tapeworms have a sucker, so I mentioned this region in your outline. All right, so let's look at the phylum. Oh, sorry, forgot I had this image of you. Tapeworms can get really long. I'm not gonna keep this on here for too long, but this entire yellow thing, you guys, that's the tapeworm body that this doctor is trying to get out of this man. So 19 foot man has been treated with deworming medication. So tapeworms are very specialized to live inside your intestines. They don't they're not detected. Um, they can get to huge, huge lengths, but they stay very quiet inside your body. So they're very good parasites because they're not detected by your body. All right, moving on to the phylum Annelida. So annelids are segmented worms, and your poster child for this is your earthworm. Okay, so segmented worms have these regular repeated segments. Okay, that's the whole thing. So they're segmented bodies with identical sections. So when you injure one section, it's not as likely to be lethal because the other segments perform the same function. So they're kind of repeated units over and over again. And you guys probably have seen worms that have been um, injured or you know cut a chunk of the worm off, but it actually can survive that. So annelids are these segmented worms with a modular design. Um, gases will go through their skin again. Um, Earthworms will have a mouth and anus. It's very difficult to tell which end is which. Um, I'm not an expert on that, but they will eat with one end and excrete waste with the other end. Um, their whole uh, gases, right? So oxygen and carbon dioxide have to move through their skin. So this is sort of their respiratory membrane. We're, when we talk about the respiratory system coming up, we'll talk about this again. But this is the reason why um, worms when it rains you'll see a whole bunch of earthworms up on the surface of the dirt instead of underneath because 
when it rains, the air pockets in the soil gets you know, wet, so it's clogged and the, the earthworms will drown if they stay underneath. Um, so they have to come up to the surface so they can actually diffuse um, gases. So um, that's, one, that's the reason why you see earthworms on the surface of the earth after it rains. All right, so I mentioned number three, they have a complete digestive tract with mouth and anus. And earthworms are very, very valuable. So number four, just one plug with earthworms. They're really good for recycling nutrients. So I mentioned that in your notes that when they eat, they eat their way through the soil and they can both aerate the soil. So when they crawl around, they create little you know, grooves and that's good to get oxygen into the soil because plants, their roots also need oxygen. And they also um, can increase the amount of nutrients available because as they go around and they eat the, the things in the soil, they break those molecules down even further and allow those molecules, those simpler molecules to be in the soil for the plants to take up. So their poop is basically really nice fertilizer that you can use for plants. So earthworms are always welcome um, in sort of compost bins and in healthy soil. And it's good for plants to have earthworms. All right, our third worm is a round worm. So this is not flat, it's not segmented, it's round. So think of like a pencil, right? A pencil is round and uniform. These are some examples of um, round worms. You may not have heard of round worms um, just because they're just not as uh, you know, prevalent in, uh, in visually present as an earthworm is. But um, roundworms, these phylum nematodes, they're cylindrical in shape. They're tapered at both ends. So you can take a look at this picture, right? This is a tapered end and this is a tapered end. They tend to have that shape. Um, they're very important decomposers in the soil. So like I was talking about with earthworms, roundworms also do this. They they decompose uh, larger molecules into smaller ones and allow those smaller molecules to be used by plants. Um, most of these roundworms are gonna be free living, but there are some parasites. Um, the one I have highlighted here is called a pinworm. Um, I don't know, I don't have a picture of a pinworm. These I think might be pinworms here in the center. But their pinworms are, uh, they are um, sort of parasites of humans. So you can have a pinworm infection and they're more common in children um, than in adults, but um, I, I do have a little example of pinworms. What happens is you, you accidentally eat the pinworm eggs in the environment, so um, no one wants to eat, you know, worm eggs, but they're so small that they are, you know, invisible to the naked eye, so you accidentally eat them. <clears throat> the eggs will hatch in your intestines. Uh, there's male and female pinworms, and when they mate um, inside your intestines, the female actually will travel to the opening of your anus, right? So when you're sleeping, um, when your body is very still, those females will travel to the opening and lay the eggs um, at the opening to the digestive tract, which is basically for them, it's your anus. And this actually prompts itching. So one of the symptoms of a pinworm infection is extreme itching, especially at night when this is happening. And for children, right, they might itch, they might still be asleep and itch, and then they might not wash their hands in the morning. And the eggs can be, uh, they're very sticky and they can be underneath the fingernails, they can be on the sheets and the bedding. And so reinfection is possible or the parents can get infected uh, because these eggs are just around. So um, it's treatable, it's not a big deal, it's not life-threatening or anything, but it is an infection of these roundworms. Um, other roundworms I've, I've listed are hookworms and trichinella. You may have heard of trichinella as um, something that's in uncooked pork, which is true. There are these worms that can burrow inside the muscle of pork, uh, of pigs, and then when you eat pork, you could um, accidentally get infected with trichinella. Um, so it's always a good idea to cook your meat to the uh, recommended temperature, right? And the recommended temperatures are recommended because they kill these parasites. All right, so that's our roundworm. So next up is the phylum arthropoda uh, or arthropods. And uh, these are, this is a really big group of animals. They all have jointed limbs in common. So look at the word arthro, right? This is the word for joints. 
So um, if you think about arthritis, if you have arthritis, that means that your joints are inflamed. So arthro in arthritis refers to joints. So all of these animals will have jointed limbs. They're gonna have joints. So let's just appreciate um, all the different kinds of animals that have joints. Um, so any insect, right, they crawl around with jointed limbs. We have crustaceans, like we have our crabs. Um, we have worms, centipede, not sorry, not worms, centipedes and millipedes. Um, so let's look at some uh, characteristics of our crustaceans here. I'm sorry, not crustaceans, our arthropods. All right, so uh, let's look at, in your outline, we have jointed limbs. These guys are segmented animals, so they're going to have um, specialized body regions. Um, they're going to have uh, division of labor among these body regions. So for example, if you look at this um, spider, right, these, arach these arachnids, they're going to have uh, an area that's specialized for feeding. They're going to have this thorax that we specialize for breathing and also contains some digestive organs. And then they're in the circulatory system. And they're going to have an abdomen that's going to have other specialized organs for reproduction and excretion and waste, right? So these are the jointed limbs that they have, the joints um, in their legs. And so that's what we mean by segmented. So segmented means like this tick, right? There's a head and then they have a really big other region with the, the thorax and abdomen together. Um, same thing for this black widow. Um, can't really see it very well, but you can see that the head will be different than the thorax, will be different than the abdomen. All right, so um, a lot of these animals will have exoskeletons. Let me just um, move through real quick and then we'll talk about the exoskeleton. So this, this is one class. If you look at number five, these are the different classes of arthropods. Um, we have arachnids, we have crustaceans, millip insects, uh, millipedes and centipedes. But let's talk about this exoskeleton for a second. So a lot of these organisms um, will have an exoskeleton. What an exoskeleton is, is a hard structure on the outside of their bodies to protect them, right? So one of the, um, so if you look at the exoskeleton, the exoskeleton is for protection, letter A, like physical protection, right? From pr predators or from being banged around in the environment, but also it's a protection for dehydration. Right, their soft bodies inside are vulnerable, and if it's a dry day, they can actually lose water through their skin. So this um, exoskeleton helps them slow down that water loss and prevents dehydration. It's also a point of attachment for muscles that help them move around, so they need their um, exoskeleton. But one big advantage is that the skeleton doesn't stretch. It doesn't grow with them. So every once in a while when the animal is growing, um, it needs to shed its existing small exoskeleton and then, so you can see this crab is backing out of its shell, right? And then the crab now has a soft shell. It has a, um, a covering on it, but it's very malleable and it has not become hard yet. And so this crab can now grow, go through a growth stage and get bigger at the same time of laying down a new shell. This is called a soft shelled crab. So if you've ever seen soft shell crabs um, at a restaurant on the menu, you're eating a crab at its basically most vulnerable point of its life, right? It's just shed, it's exoskeleton, and this shedding process is called molting, by the way. And now you have a, a crab that's unprotected and uh, served up with some tartar sauce, I guess. I don't know, <laughs> but that's what molting is. So molting uh, is a disadvantage of having an exoskeleton because for that period of time without your exoskeleton, you're vulnerable to dehydration and you're also vulnerable to, um, you know, being unprotected and being vulnerable to, to predators. Okay, so that's uh, the exoskeleton and molting. Another uh, characteristic of this group of animals is that they have compound eyes. Uh, in simple eyes, they have more sophisticated eyes, they have better vision, um, and they have more of a, a sort of a higher ordered uh, nervous system, um, and the nervous system, of course, is responsible for creating eyes. Um, so these are just the different eyes that you find in this um, phyla of organisms. These are simple eyes, so simple eyes would just have this one sort of clear round area. And then these are compound eyes. So compound eyes will have many units here. Um, 
I forgot the name of it. There's a specific name for these units, but this is what a compound eye looks like. All right, um, now let's go back and take a look at these different um, classes. So we have arachnids first. Arachnids are spiders, right? So you guys need to know when you hear the word arachnids, what kind of animals are in this group? Um, spiders, okay, mostly, but also scorpions and ticks um, and mites are also part of these arachnids. So what makes arachnids arachnids is that they have four pairs of walking legs, um, so eight legs total, and they also have a specialized pair for feeding. So you can see these specialized appendages for feeding. Uh, the scorpion here has specialized appendages in the anterior portion, right, for feeding and trapping prey, and it also has one, two, three, four legs on one side, it'll have four legs on the other side. So um, that's the characteristic of arachnids. Okay. For crustaceans, crustaceans are usually aquatic, and they're almost all aquatic, which means that they live in water, except for our little pill bug here. Um, I used to call them roly polies when I was little, um, but they have different kind of nicknames. These are the only um, land. Uh, crustaceans. So when you see one of these guys go, oh, that's a crustacean. <laughs> it's the only terrestrial test of crustacean, but everything else is in the water. So you see barnacles and shrimp and crayfish and crab. So crabs are a good uh, example of a crustacean or you can think of lobster. Um, but yeah, so they have multiple pairs of specialized appendages. Um, the appendages, for example, are your antennae and your feeding appendages, these um, large arms for the crab. All right, and then we have the insects. Okay, it's jumping down one in your outline. Insects will all contain three body parts. They have a head, thorax, and abdomen. Insects all have antennas. They all have eyes. They all have six legs. They are generally one or two pairs of wings. They can fly. And um, when they grow, some in insects uh, don't molt. Um, I'm sorry, not molt. They don't uh, metamorph undergo metamorphosis, but others do. So if you look at these grasshoppers, the grasshoppers will actually stay the same sort of body shape from young to adult, um, and they grow with molting, so they lose their shell. But then others undergo metamorphosis. So metamorphosis is, oops, this. So you have completely two body plans, right? You have a, a centipede or a caterpillar um, in one, the young larval form, and then you have a completely different um, adult form. So metamorphosis means changing of the body plan, right? Your body shape completely changes. So um, this is a typical picture of metamorphosis where you have a larval caterpillar, it forms a pupa, and then inside, it's undergoing drastic changes to its body, emerges as an adult out of its cocoon, and then it flies away. Okay, so pretty amazing. Um, if we go look at our millipedes and centipedes, so the difference between a millipede and a centipede is the number of legs per segment. So a millipede has two legs per body segment, and a centipede only has one leg per segment. There are other small or differences as well. Um, centipedes are terrestrial carnivores. Centipedes are pretty nasty. They're poisonous and millipedes are not. So centipedes are usually the nastier kind um, of arachnid. I'm sorry, of um, arthropod. Okay. Let's see, I think we are done with our arthropods. Yeah, so I'll pause it here.